It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 247 of Science on Top. Today is Wednesday, the 16th of November, 2016. I'm Ed Brown and I'm joined by Penny Dumsday. Hello. And Lucas Randall. Hello. So we are back after a bit of a break. Uh, I want to thank the good people of the United Kingdom for making my holiday a real blast. Uh, it was a very fun adventure. I particularly enjoyed having lunch with a long-time listener, Pete Ellinger, in a pub called The Dog at Over P. Over. And that's, yes, its actual name. And I should also say to any American listeners, uh, congratulations on getting an internet connection from your underground nuclear bunker, which is the only safe way, I think, to wait out the next four years before you emerge and try to rebuild civilization. Good I job. I was thinking, like, where is Ed going with this? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I like there is probably someone who has been living in a bunker and hasn't heard the news Ugh. and is not sure what's going on. What? What's what's a Trump? Anyway, let's not talk politics because that is just too scary a thought at the moment and instead look at genetics and an extensive series of experiments uh, where biologies at the University of Toronto, sorry, Toronto, have developed a new genetic map of yeast. Well, what it really is, is a reference guide for how to chart genetic interactions within a cell, as opposed to the conventional method of looking at individual genes. Penny, this is looking at how groups of genes are connected, yeah? Yeah, so I didn't know much about the genetics of yeast before reading this article, so full disclaimer. <laughs> <laughs> but apparently in yeast, only one in five genes seems to be essential. So there's about 6,000 genes in yeast and if 1200 mm -hmm. of them if any one of these like essential 1200 genes are destroyed then the yeast dies but if one of the other genes is uh, removed the yeast keeps going however it's not the same if a pair of genes is removed and because there's a there's a lot of redundancy in the genetic code in all at all sorts of levels so in the way that the amino acids are coded for it can be more than one sequence of nucleotides, and so on. So it's not surprising to find that there's pairs of genes in yeast that do the same job. If one of them gets knocked out, the yeast can still go on. But if they're both removed, then it can be catastrophic. So this was a question that started to be asked about 17 years ago, and it's really worthwhile reflecting on the kinds of technology that have been developed in the past 17 yeah. years and how ideas and technology can kind of catch up with each other sometimes. So this blew my mind thinking about it. To find out about the pairs of genes they created using, and I don't know any more about these, but I would love to, yeast-growing robots. <laughs> they created 23, a fleet of yeast-growing robots, 23 million strains of yeast, each missing a pair of genes. So I'm guessing they're testing all these... <laughs> combinations like just think about that for a moment about the amount of yeah. data processing and sheer organization even with the help of robots because it, presumably it, you'd have to do it like random combinations random pairs wouldn't you you wouldn't have to do you know this one and next one you'd have to do or every possible That's combination like, i haven't done the maths i remember something in you know vc or in high school maths about like figuring this kind of stuff out but i'm guessing if you have six thousand mm. genes and you test every single pair it's somewhere close to 23 million yeah yeah <laughs> ouch that's ex that's awesome. So what? The <laughs> and as you say, this was 17 years ago they yeah. started doing this, and we think of you know gene sequencing now as a fairly quick, rapid process. But back then, it would have been a lot more complicated. Who knows how long they thought it would take? Anyway, what they found in the hmm. end is that there's 550,000 pairs that, if they're removed, won't work. So what it shows is that there's there's genes that do the same job. And it also helps to understand how the cell operates in greater detail, like what's going on in the genetic code. Rather than single genes operating in isolation, 
how they work together. So you can kind of think Mm. about clusters of genes involved in metabolism or, you know, taking out garbage and so on. And this is, the product of this is essentially a map where you can go on a website or I guess a researcher can go on a website, look out the genes that they're studying and find new connections. And it's already led to um, new research. So they emailed someone, Claire Moore, who got an email from them because she studies yeast. She's focusing on a process called polyadenylation where molecules get attached to RNA. And she got this email saying that they found a gene. Could she check it out? And just led to new avenues in research. So sometimes just collecting data for the sake of data is really exciting. Mm. So, yeah, I think what really struck me about this was just the sheer scope of it. And it was just yeast. And it was just pears. And I do think, (laughs) what if they'd done threes? Like, I don't know, you know. Yeah, well, maybe yeah. that's the next step. Maybe that's the next 17 See. years of study is going to be... Like looking at what, how the clusters interact. Greater combinations yeah. and things, yeah. Yeah, it's fascinating. Also, I think it's really interesting because yeast is... Lab-grown yeah. yeast is kind of... It's well looked after. It, it gets the nutrients that it needs. It's in the right conditions and everything. But yeast mm. in the wild has to be flexible and adaptive. So, it needs different ways of coping with things, different ways of metabolizing things, different ways of getting rid of rubbish. Yeah, so in different... Yeah. So obviously these sort of complementary genes are ways for it to adapt, I guess. It's fascinating. Maybe. and Yeah, and maybe if they did this experiment in different settings, like with, you know, starving yeast or something, they would have got different results. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Which all strikes me that I love science but do not have the personality to be a scientist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You have to wait 17 years of hard work before you actually get something yeah. concrete, I guess. And then you're but like, oh, but what I also think they would have, along the way, so not me. they would have been finding things, but yeah. <laughs> I just think it's awesome that something like just mm. yeast can give us so much mm. information because obviously what works in yeast, the same principles are going to work in other organisms. And I'm sure a few of those genes are ones we have too. In other cells. Even if they're not, yeah. No, oh, definitely. All right, very cool. Well, shall we move on, Lucas? Because uh, a new study uh, of Hubble telescope observations has increased the number of galaxies that we know about in the universe, and the new count now stands at 2 trillion. That's almost 10 times the previous estimate of 120 billion. How did, did we just not count correctly the first time, or is this just we've learnt so much more? Over time, it's really it's it's primarily down to an improvement in the technology. The first estimate that was made, which is sort of back very early in Hubble's life, and I you know we've talked before about Hubble's early life when it needed you know glasses basically when it was blurry because it was launched with the yeah it had uh, issues focusing and so forth. So over the years, there were several missions to upgrade Hubble. So in the sometime in the early the early to mid nineties is when the uh, deep field I think was taken. Mm-hmm. Um, oh no, ninety six. Ninety six. There yeah. you go. It's right in front of me. I even highlighted it. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah. So ninety six. There was the Hubble deep field. So th- this is a really famous set of images that you've you've probably you know seen because it's just stunning and gorgeous. And basically, the astronomers at the time pointed Hubble, which had had uh, you know been corrected for its vision problems, at quite a small region of space, and they pointed it there for about ten days. Uh, so they got a really long exposure. And of course, anyone who does any photography knows that the longer your exposure, the more light, the more photons you actually capture with your uh, with your detector and uh, so as a result they ended up with a stunning gorgeous gorgeous image which uh, is I've got a, a wide format print of this um, well I don't it's on my son's wall so he has a wide format <laughs> print of this at home cool. you know, it's like two meters wide which is just oh wow uh, gorgeous yeah there's some perks for where I used to work but, um, <laughs> yeah so that that image is uh, it contains a, a huge number of, of galaxies um, so what they did was they they took that image back you know in the in the mid 90s and they extrapolated it out they go well if this region of space that we were staring at um, uh, is is representative of space all around us then that region of space um, we should be able to sort of roughly extrapolate that out understanding that we're only seeing back 
Uh, we're only seeing out to about 3.2 billion parsecs, which is about 12 billion light years away. So knowing, of course, that this is, um, you know, maybe one and a half, one and three quarters uh, um, uh, billion years after the, the Big Bang. So we're not seeing all the way back, but but it's a good representation. So basically that's what they did. They just uh, extrapolated out and they knew even back then that there was the figure that they got, which was around 120 billion, um, couldn't have been quite right because there was there was mass missing, and some of the mass, of course, was was likely to have been um, you know dark matter. There was non-luminous um, mass out there, gas and so forth that wasn't lit up. And Hubble's an optical telescope, so you can really only see you know the the uh, luminous objects, so galaxies, stars, and that sort of thing, or anything that's reflecting light. And also so, the Hubble Deep Field, that the sample of sky that they took, they pretty much went for let's find the darkest, emptiest right. space we can find and see yeah. what's there. So it's not going Correct. to be representative mm. of the rest of the sky. There's going to be more populous, uh, denser areas and less dense. Yeah, areas. but the, the thought, the, the the intention there was to 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 get out of the get out of the Milky Way. So yeah. they didn't, they yeah. wanted they wanted a dark piece of sky because then they were going to get more of a, a background image of what's beyond our, our local group. So yep. that was why they pointed at that spot. But yes, you're right. Um, you know, there's obviously things and we, we do, you know, uh, we do know that uh, matter is, is uh, in clumps all around us and it, mm-hmm. uh, there's different groupings of those clumps depending on how far out you get. But, uh, but yeah, it's not evenly distributed. But, you know, if you, if you do pick a, a piece of sky, which, um, you know, it's free of local disturbances, then, uh, uh, sort of made me think of <laughs> Star Wars there for a second. <laughs> it's a disturbance in the force. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, then, uh, then yeah, I mean, that, that was what they did is they extrapolated that out. And, and the missing mass was basically uh, thought to be gas and dust and, and non-luminous things and dark matter and all that sort of thing. So it's a big step, though, to go from around 120 billion galaxies to... What was the new one? Two, two trillion, trillion galaxies? Two trillion, yeah. That's a lot of billions. So, <laughs> um, yeah, it's a pretty big step. And and the real, the main reason for this is, although they were still using Hubble uh, and a few other instruments, but, pr- but primarily Hubble, they were they were using Hubble after it had been upgraded in, hmm. in, uh, in the 2000s. 2009. Um, so, yeah. yeah, so they were able to get, basically out a lot further so they went out to 4 billion parsecs so 13 billion light years away and and you know that that extra throw meant that a they had a lot more detections to work with but they also changed the way that they they calculated it because they looked at um, the number of galaxies um, and then the the mass that should correspond to various distances away from us and then they extrapolated that to account for other galaxies that were too small or faint to, to, for telescopes to pick up so it kind of seems to me reading this that it's like an extrapolation of an extrapolation hmm. but um, it's based on our expectations so it's not purely observational and I think that's important to note with this because this is still very much, an estimate with unknown unknowns thrown into the variable mix, that, that seems to me. Hmm. Other astronomers have said, yep, this sort of matches what we'd expect to see. And that makes me wonder if there's a bit of a, a bias here in terms of, you know, tweaking your your um, your figures and tweaking your variables to match your expectations. So that, I think that's something that even the researchers are aware of as well. But generally speaking, the astronomers are saying they kind of think it's maybe going to be more than this um, to match in with other things that we're seeing. But as you know, the story said right at the beginning, this is an upgraded estimate. Yeah. And that's exactly what what we now have is an upgraded estimate. And and I think that's that's a good thing to to, to understand because. Um, this figure of 120 billion is quoted often, so uh, I do see this in other uh, other articles and other papers and so forth. So it's good to sort of update that and and get out a, an updated number, which is vastly different from from what there was. But now, of course, we're waiting for for James Webb. Yeah, James Webb Space Telescope is the the next best, you know, or the next awesome thing that that that's going up there in terms of looking back in time. And James Webb operates in different wavelengths of, of light. It's, it crosses into the infrared. It's an awesome, awesome telescope, and we have very high expectations of it. 
and uh, we won't really know a great deal more until it's up. Not about this, I mean. We'll know lots of things about other stuff. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, while we're talking about it, uh, let's uh, talk about the uh, James Webb Space Telescope because it's ready for testing now and will be on, it's on yeah. schedule for launch in 2018. Yes, very cool. So basically, the uh, it, it had got quite behind schedule, and there were issues, various issues that you know, if you've been following the the stories over the last few years, there were um, oh, there looking was at cancelling it at one about point. it never being finished. Yeah, exactly. That it would have been canned, and it's a it's a very expensive mission, and it required a lot of sacrifices by a lot of other um, astronomers and a lot of other you know professionals involved with uh, with NASA and, and and the various agencies because it sucked up a big chunk of the NASA budget hmm. so when when NASA was was looking at uh, you know as as other you know more or less most of the US government were, were facing uh, you know severe funding crisis um, there was a lot of planetary science that was that was sacrificed to keep James James Webb going, but I mean this to me, and I've said before that I think Hubble is is in terms of individual instruments, not mm-hmm. technologies, but individual instruments. I think Hubble's responsible for you know uh, perhaps arguably the, the most amount of science of any one single instrument in the history of mankind you know i'm not saying it's compared to microscopes or something which we've discussed before no but, but a single you know, instrument, in terms of in- yeah, i think you're probably individual right yeah um it's just stunning how much we attribute to hubble and uh um, you know, when you when you think that James Webb is is you know, there's so much hinging on James Webb getting up there. There's so mm. many times it's now quite it's mentioned in articles and and papers talking about what we you know the next step. Well, we now we can't do much more until we get to James Webb. So it's it's huge and it's it's exciting. <laughs> it's so huge. yeah, basically the new it's huge and it is big. But the the latest news is that the build of James Webb is finished, which is fantastic. It's been finished and it's now going through its its testing periods, you know, in the, in the uh, special labs at uh, uh, JPL. So, yeah, so yeah be really exciting. Stressing it and subjecting it to heat and cold and yeah. winds and pressures and all sorts of things to make sure that it's going to survive. Because I think, like, it's it's going to be launched in a rocket. Not, there's no space shuttle anymore. And then it has to unfold and move and tilt and point in the yeah. right direction and everything. Has its massive yeah, exactly. heat shield facing the sun all the time, so it's a pretty uh, sophisticated thing. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty complex. So most of the testing, well, there'll be a huge amount of that testing, as you say, that will relate to making sure it can cope with its launch, because yeah. the you know the, the the G's exerted on it are going to be fairly significant during the launch. But but also you know making sure it can deploy uh, once it's up mm-hmm. there, as you said, mm-hmm. and and then making sure that it can cope with the conditions. Um, it's going to be parked in a in a cool spot to basically shield it from the, from direct sunlight so yeah. you know it needs to operate really really cool and you know that also puts an upper limit on its lifetime too because uh there'll be no servicing missions possible <laughs> because it's too far out come on elon elon musk will save us <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yes. no it's good that it's on track then for uh, october 2018 launch which is uh, getting ever closer Something it's yeah, to... it's going to be upon us in no time. So it's um, yeah. it's very very cool, and and I, I think maybe worth mentioning as well that just this week in in the news, just talking about missions that uh, that, that perhaps didn't make it, is uh, yeah. there's there's um, some new evidence indicating that maybe the Beagle lander actually survived its its landing and and partially deployed some of its instruments. So this is the um, British you know, Mars probe. Yes, uh, from yes, oh, exactly. Two thousand and three, I think it was. A lot of broken broken hearts and. Mm. and and so forth when when that uh, that mission didn't uh, come to fruition. So I think it was on Christmas Day or something. I can't remember now. Does that it's... ring a bell? It was on Christmas Day when it didn't work or something, or it was supposed to land. But yeah, just really crappy. No matter what day, really. But uh, <laughs> but yeah, true. it's um. But uh, yeah, it turns so that, out it was cool. it was it all went perfectly except for one thing at the end or something. I think it was it was almost. A, well, yeah, a, they a think it just couldn't success. establish comms. It couldn't what? Yeah. It, it just couldn't establish communications. So oh, that, that's okay. What so it actually about. landed everything Basically, was fine. And, well, yeah, it landed and deployed its panels and everything and then went, now what? <laughs> um, <laughs> Earth, are you there? Earth, hello, Earth. No, not here. Sorry. Oh, well. Oh, crap. Uh, from space and the very big things to very small things and bacteria, let's talk about pimples. 
A team at the University of California, San Diego, say they've discovered a previously unknown way that bacteria causes acne. Penny, they did this by studying the Propione bacterium acnes, which is the main bacteria linked to pimples. Yeah, I like to call it P acnes for obvious reasons. (laughs) It's easy to say. Um, What they found is that when this... um, bacterium is in an airless environment it secretes a certain kind of or it turns sebum which is you know the sort of the oil that gets on your face Mm -hmm. into fatty acids and these fatty acids cause nearby cells to become inflamed and that inflammation response causes a cascade um it deactivates certain enzymes and you get acne so what that's really interesting is we've for the first time got a mechanism of how this bacterium acts on skin cells to make them to you know induce inflammation and get acne and this may not seem like a big deal but it kind of is because acne is like quite stressful for a lot of people so and it's common i think 80 percent of people have it at some point in their life yeah and you know some people can get it really badly it can be quite uncomfortable and blah 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 so (laughs) now we know this what can we do We can't just get rid of the bacteria. For one, you can't get rid of it. It forms a biofilm and anchors onto your skin. And the other problem is is when you use things like antibiotics and so on that get rid of everything, that's also not great because there's other strains of this bacterium that are quite good for your skin's health. And again, it's that whole thing of thinking of ourselves as an ecosystem. However, now we know that there's this particular kind of fatty acid that's causing the inflammation, it might be possible to somehow block its action or stop the cells responding to this fatty acid. I have no idea how, but Mm. I think that could be really interesting because a lot of acne treatments that people go through and, you know, working in a school, I see teenagers, they can be pretty Mm. full on. Yeah, they're often hormonal, aren't they? Yeah. mess with you. Girls already raging the hormones. Pill, um, yeah. <laughs> I thought you meant the, the teenagers were hormonal. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, no. I, mean, the teenagers are I now realise how that could be ambiguous, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but often, you know, girls might go on the pill because it can help with acne. But, I mean, that's a huge deal. Mm. And, like, Accutane and that sort of thing, again, is, like, really serious medication. So if they could develop something from this mechanism, I think that would be great. I think it's also interesting that we've actually – found out the mechanism because I always assumed that I knew that, you know, there was bacteria involved and that the, the pores would get clogged. And I assumed it was then an immune response to uh, inflame that area. Mm. But it's actually the bacteria are turning that sebum into a sort of a, I guess, a toxin, you could say, mm. those fatty acids. Yeah, yeah. That's causing that response. That's really interesting. So, yeah, maybe there'll be a cream that can reduce the fatty acids or maybe a way of only killing the right bacteria, I guess. Who knows? No, oh, if only my 17-year-old self could have had <laughs> I think we've all been there. Mm-hmm. But uh, very cool. Uh, and let's uh, talk about the supermoon, Lucas. I know you've uh, got a bit of a bee in your bonnet about this. Uh, this supermoon that we had this week that was bigger than all the other supermoons that were super, and it's how, – how super was it? <laughs> well, I, I've I've uh, I've heard quite a few people say uh, uh, to me and also on the radio and other you know means that they were really disappointed in the supermoon. It's like, oh, oh my really? god, I've definitely seen the moon bigger than that. What a load of rubbish! <laughs> and, and it's this sort of thing. Ah, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, well, I mean, just last night I was uh, uh, I went out to pick up my daughter from her, her dancing, and I, on my way back, the radio was on, and uh, it was um, uh, what's his name, Kyle. Sandy Lands and um, uh, yes, his co-host, whose name I forget, Jackie. Jackie uh, and he was yeah, they were talking about it, and he was saying, "Oh, that's crap! I've definitely seen bigger, bigger moons." And and of course, the the thing that was really touted and and talked about in the media prior to this was that this is the 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 superest super moon <laughs> you're going to see more or less in your in your life because uh, uh, the you know the last time it was even near this close was back in the 40s or something or other. So sh- should we and, should we and, break it down and explain what a super moon is? This is yeah, well, it, yeah. So, supermoon is not an, an, an astronomy term at all. It, it, it was, according to Phil Plate, which I found interesting, it was actually uh, this, this this term came from an yes. astrologer. Right. Uh, they're the ones that do the star signs and so forth. So, yeah, it's like the the moon is in Uranus and whatever the hell, is, whatever you know, impact has been there on your life and so forth. 
Okay. I did. I, I did. <laughs> but um, the moon itself is not and- actually bigger. It just appears bigger no. because it's at perigee, which is its closest to, yes. well, to Earth. Because it, it has an elliptical orbit. It's not yep. a, a circular orbit. So it does, you know, it, its uh, furthest point, which is called apogee, is, is, is the furthest away that it, it gets in its orbit. And its perigee is when it's the closest to Earth. And the distance, you know, the difference between those two extremes of its orbit are about 10%. Of, of its, uh, in terms of a change in its mm-hmm. total distance from the centre of the Earth to the centre of the Moon, which is how the measurements are made. Yep. So 10% is not much. Right? 10% is actually not much at all. And especially when you're talking about something that is so small in the sky, I mean, to put it in context, if you hold out your thumb at uh, the full extension of your arm, you can you can more or less block the Moon out uh, in, in you know of the sky. So, you know, you have a... You, you have, may have in your mind a, a, a picture of how big the moon is in the sky, which is quite warped. Hmm. And the reality is it's really, really very small. And this is why, uh, you know, by a fluke, more or less, the size of the moon in the sky more or less matches up with the size of the disk of the sun in the sky. So that's yep. why we have those really cool eclipses, solar eclipses, because the moon can actually completely block out the suns but that only happens when it's closer to us and its orbits when it's closer to its uh, perigee when it's at apogee when it's further away from us it doesn't fully block out the sun so i think that's a good you know if you've ever seen a solar eclipse or seen photos of a solar eclipse sometimes you get a solar eclipse where you can see the outside of the sun you can see the outside of the disk of the sun um, breaking the edges of the moon and that that shows you really the difference in in what a uh, a moon at apogee and a moon at perigee is, it's a very little difference. Um, uh, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson uh, tweeted uh, about the difference being, if you can think about it, being a 16-inch pizza um, compared to a 16.05-inch pizza. That would be a super pizza in this parlance. So, you know, it, it's it's a snipe, but it's true. So, I I was a little bit, oh, what's the word? grumpy <laughs> about the the coverage that, that it was receiving because a lot of people ask me about it because I know my interest in, in astronomy so mm. it was uh it's like oh you're going to see the supermoon it's like no nah, probably not no, I don't <laughs> think so um it's uh, you know I've seen the moon <laughs> I've seen this with a telescope a lot bigger yeah. um so, so uh and it's and, and people, you're in I Melbourne just had really there were clouds yeah and, I was in <laughs> Melbourne and it was it was pissing down rain and it was overcast and it was yuck but anyway point is all of the coverage that I saw also took pains to point out that people uh, would best experience this phenomenon by going to uh, an east-facing beach and watching the moon rise as the sun sets because, of course, being a full moon, which is what – that's the other part of a supermoon. So a yeah. supermoon occurs when the moon is at perigee, so it's closest to us in its elliptical orbit, and also it's within a few hours of when the moon is completely full. So when the moon is full, it's on the opposite side of the Earth to the sun. Um, so, so as one sets, the other one – basically rises uh, depends slightly where you are on the spheroid that we're we call home but uh, that's more or less what happens so uh, it was you know all the coverage is saying people should go to a beach or something and that's facing east and then they'll get the, the best experience and the reason for that is because of the very very well-known optical illusion that occurs in the way that our brain interprets what what it's seeing when the moon is coming above the horizon, that's when you will often see these incredible, you know, strawberry moons and harvest moons and all these other moons that that people always have photographs on or all all over Flickr, and they have them typically sitting behind something like a building or or a, you know trees or something like that, things with which we are familiar and things that our brain knows are big. Mm-hmm. You put the moon behind them and you have them a long way away, and our brain goes. Well, that building's big, therefore the moon must be huge in comparison. And the reality is, it's usually a trick of of, of the of the very long telephoto zoom of that lens, which has enabled it to get in and and um, you know make a, a building which you can't even see with the naked eye actually you know big enough to see in the picture, which of course makes the moon behind it much much bigger. But the reality is, if you uh, measure that, say by holding a coin in front of it or something, or, or as I mentioned, your outstretched, outstretched thumb, you could still block it out, just the same as when it's up in the sky. The moon doesn't actually get any bigger when it's at the horizon. Maybe just a little bit, arguably, going through the, uh, you know, being a magnified effect through the, the, the atmosphere. atmosphere. But very little, you know, not much that you'd really notice. So, yeah, that was my, my gripe. Uh, my gripe was that 
you know, it's great to get people to look up. It's great to, yeah. you know, encourage people to go out and experience these sorts of events. And I love seeing things just because they're historical. This is why I tend mm-hmm. to, you know, be excited about transits of, you know, Venus in front of the sun and so forth, because it doesn't mm-hmm. happen all that often. It's really cool to see. But, yeah, you know, it's just a little dot moving across a disc. It's not, you know, I, I think you, you, touch, you touched on the issue for me is I don't really care that it's only a little bit brighter or a little bit bigger or not even noticeably so. I'm just happy that people are going out and looking and talking about the moon. And it's a conversation starter because you can say, well, you know, we've only sent 12 humans there. We should be sending more there. You can talk about space exploration. It's a good conversation starter and it gets people thinking about the universe around. I agree. Them. I just, I, I wish it could have been, it could have been discussed in, in a, in a way that didn't set people up to be disappointed. And that, that's what annoyed me about it. Is um you know yes it's it's a cool event it's something that is uh you know different and and sure you know nothing wrong with you and have a look at it that's fantastic but you know don't don't oversell it so much it's reminded me of these things of like oh next August Mars will be as big as the full moon you know those ones that do the rounds on Facebook you know yeah. every every couple of years true. or whatever yeah <laughs> <laughs> will never be true never ever. Will that be true? Unless something's <laughs> really wrong and we're screwed. Yeah, in which case that's then the last screwed. thing on our mind is, oh, wow, look how big it is. It's Holy <laughs> shit, the gravity is gone. Yeah. Um, whoops, <laughs> that's war. Well, at the very least, you know, it, it, it conspires to throw us out of the orbit of the sun, which would be bad for us. <laughs> that would not end well. Anyway, your homework, listeners, is to get out and have a look at the moon anyway no matter how big or small it appears, and to look up and appreciate the universe around you. That's a good note to end on. Uh, of course, you can get more information on all the stories at scienceontop.com slash 247. And from there, you can find all the ways to get in touch with us. And if you like the show, and I assume you do because you've listened all the way to the end, why not share the experience with a friend and tell them all about us? You might uh, get them hooked as well. Speaking of friends, thank you, Penny and Lucas. Thank you, Ed. Oh, thank you, Ed. This episode was edited with thought and precision by Marcos Benamou. And thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next week, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. I hope very much, you know, Donald Trump is nobody's fool. And during the campaign, he talks about climate change being a hoax. Yeah. You know what? Climate change is not a hoax. It is a threat to this entire planet. He better start listening to the scientific communities and not just the coal companies. And if he doesn't, and if he doesn't. If he doesn't, you're not going to have much of a planet left for your grandchildren. I know that. I know that. We're worried a lot about that. And I think, you know, you talk about people in the streets. I think when millions of people, led by the young people, who want to transform this country, say, sorry, Mr. Trump, I want this planet to be healthy and habitable for my children and my grandchildren And that is more important than the short-term profits of the oil industry. I think we can stop them in that area.